Jubilee is on the horizon. Be joyful, be loud, ring the bells of freedom as we await the day of our final redemption. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss and this is episode seven of an ongoing series that we've been in. It's based on a book, God, Forgive Me? It's by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. The book is about sacrifices that are required of us by God to atone for our sins. Now, as Christians, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross covers our sins when we accept him as our savior. But it's important for us to understand why a sacrifice was necessary and how Jesus' sacrifice fulfilled the law of Moses. At this point in the series, we're in chapter seven of the book. If you'd like to get your hands on one of the books, you can do that by purchasing a copy of it. You can get a hard copy on our website, or you can download a free PDF copy at the website, which is crosstalk.org. We're excited to be able to make these available for you. And so I encourage you, go and pick one up today. We ended up with the last episode. We finished with this questioning if animal sacrifices still happen today. Well, it turns out that there are still some groups that do it. There's a group of Samaritan descendants and they still actually do animal sacrifices for the Passover celebration. Now I can assure you that this isn't a common thing, but it's interesting to learn about. And here in a moment, you'll also hear about a group of Ethiopian Jews, but I don't want to spoil it for you. So let's pick up right where we left off. The division between the Samaritans who rejected Jerusalem's leadership and those who angrily disagreed with the Samaritans' reverence for Mount Gerizim is well documented in the New Testament. It has been proposed by various scholars that the Samaritans practiced their ancient form of Judaism because they avoided the influence of later forms of rabbinic Judaism. However, since they live in such proximity to the culture and influence of present-day Israel, it seems likely that some influence must have occurred over the centuries. Yet they maintain their distinct form of Samaritan Judaism. Now, although the Samaritan sacrifices are restricted to Passover, they continue their attempt to follow that Mosaic directive. This ancient practice is staunchly ignored by mainstream Jews. Bloodless symbols have replaced the bloody sacrifice. Perhaps this is because the concept is abhorrent to sophisticated, cultured, educated Jewish folk. More likely, the practice fails to fit into the rabbinic view that the sacrificial requirements of Scripture have been arbitrarily replaced by standards directed by the rabbis. The reality of being without an altar in the temple has prohibited those people from fulfilling the requirements of the Mosaic law in accord with Levitical standards. Nevertheless, the dilemma caused by the destruction of the temple does not stop the Samaritan Jews. This is due to the fact that they reject Jerusalem's rabbinic leadership and deny the sanctity of Jerusalem. The explanation of Chaim Shaus also clarifies another long-held misconception about the Samaritans. He wrote that modern historical research has proved that the Samaritans are not descendants of the heathen colonists settled in the northern kingdom of Israel by the conquerors of Samaria, as was once assumed. Nor are they to be identified with Nehemiah's opponents of the Persian period. Actually, the Samaritans of today are a small and poor remnant of an old and great Jewish sect that appeared in Palestine about the beginnings of the Greek period. They formed the oldest Jewish sect in existence. They were always strongly religious Jews who believed in one God and strictly observed the law of Moses. Now, some ultra-Orthodox Jews presume to control the franchise over modern Judaism as though they have the most ancient direct connection to the original flavor of Judaism. But be aware that there are much older Jewish franchisees who believe their mode of Judaism is more authentic and based on the original recipe. Their territory is small, their influence is minimal. But it was not always limited to the insignificant area where they are now found in modern Israel. In fact, in the days of the Second Temple, 
almost the entire central part of Palestine between Judah and Galilee was thickly populated with this Jewish sect of Shechem. There were also many followers of the sect in southern Syria and in other eastern lands. Today, however, there are barely 200 left. They speak Arabic and inhabit a special quarter in Nablus. They have a synagogue there and a high priest who is their teacher and spiritual leader. And that was a quote from uh, a respected Jewish scholar. Now, I must point out that as of the time of this conversation, it has been discovered that there may be as many as 800 to 900 Samaritans living in Israel. But still to this day, the Passover ritual practices maintained by these Israeli Samaritan Jews remain most similar to the practices of biblical Judaism. And the Samaritans are not the only Jews to have continued serving the God of Israel through a biblical form of animal sacrifice. It can be shown that another group of Jews were not influenced by the rabbinic leaders during the centuries following the Jewish war with Rome. Like the Samaritans, the Falashas of Ethiopia also maintained a sacrificial tradition. Are, are you familiar with the Falashas? They are the black Jews of Ethiopia. An entire history of Jewish practice apart from Rabbinic Judaism can be identified in the practices of the Ethiopian Falashas. It is now well known that the majority of Ethiopian Jews no longer live in their homeland. Most of the community made Aliyah from Ethiopia to Israel in two waves of mass immigration, assisted by the Israeli government. Operation Moses in 1984 and Operation Solomon in 1991. Today, Israel is home to the largest Beta Israel community in the world with about 160,500 citizens of Ethiopian descent in 2021 who are mainly assembled in the smaller urban areas of central Israel. Now, it's believed that as few as 10,000 falashas remain in northern Africa. Nevertheless, their original former practices are of great interest to some students of Judaism. Their practices, beliefs, and the traditions that they follow predate all forms of rabbinic Judaism. Theories abound, suggesting that their practices date back to the times of Jeremiah in 626 before the Common Era, or even as far back as the reign of King Solomon in 970 before the Common Era. Intrigue and mystery surround some accounts that seek to prove that the ancient lost Ark of the Covenant has resided among the Jews of Ethiopia since Solomon's involvement with the Queen of Sheba. Regardless of the location of the lost Ark, the lost Jews of Ethiopia offer an incredible postscript to the history of Judaism. Investigations during the last century helped date the disconnect of their relationship with the Jews of ancient Israel. The Jews of Ethiopia were quite isolated prior to their mass emigration. It was said that the Falashas know nothing of either the Babylonian or the Jerusalem Talmud, which were composed during and after the time of the captivity. They also do not observe the Feasts of Purim and the dedication of the Temple, which are still solemnly kept by the Jews of our time. You see, the holidays of Purim and Hanukkah provide mainstream Judaism with a deep sense of continuity to the Jewish struggle for survival. Both festivals highlight the destructive forces of violent anti-Semitism that has existed for millennia. The Jews of Ethiopia existed without rabbinic influence until their recent transport to Israel. Yet unlike other sects of Jews in Israel and throughout the rest of the diaspora, the Falashas survived many centuries without these festivals. This is important because Chanukah, Hanukkah has been celebrated throughout Judaism as a post-biblical holiday since the middle of the second century before the Common Era. And Purim, which celebration is the, honors Queen Esther, are even older, dating back to the 5th to the 6th centuries BC. Since the Falashas knew nothing about these festivals, it's critical to understand that the Ethiopian Jews were practicing their faith for many centuries before the festivals were added by later rabbinic Jewish leaders. And that raises another relevant question. 
What relevant factor separates this ancient sect of Judaism from the faith of the rabbis? And once again, the answer is sacrifices. The Falasha Anthology, which was originally published for the Yale Judaica series, contains a fascinating detail about the religious literature of the Ethiopian Jews. The author, who was a former professor at Brandeis University, offers his own first-hand account from shortly prior to the near miraculous mass immigrations that moved the Jews of Ethiopia home to the land of Israel. The Falasha Jews shares a fascinating similarity to the Samaritan Jews. An important religious practice of the Falashas is sacrifice. The author mentioned says that in the region I visited, sacrifices are offered only once a year, namely on the 14th of Nisan, on the eve of Passover. It seems that in other localities, they also offer sacrifices at other times and on other occasions. In keeping with First Temple and Second Temple Judaism, the Falashas offer sacrifices on an altar or area of sacrifice located in the compound of the synagogue. And like their forerunners, the Mosaic requirements were followed to maintain the ritual purity and high standards demanded by Moses of the animals sacrificed. The animal must meet the requirements of the Old Testament. It must not be blind, lame, or possessed of any corporal defect. You see, the Bible demanded unblemished sacrifices. And that causes me to want to talk further about modern Jews and ritual slaughter. If ritual animal slaughter seems unacceptably violent, it is only because we are not accustomed to seeing things die. In pioneer days, family farms were the norm, and people regularly killed what they ate. The temple priest merely did it in a fashion that was humane and a method of killing an animal that observant Jews today still follow. They still eat kosher meat that ensures that the animals were killed under regulated conditions. And that brings me to the topic of Kaporis. And let me just say, watch out, Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC, get out the way. A need for a sacrifice lives within the Jewish psyche. The rabbis may have revamped God's regulations, but the heart of God's people have always responded to their instinctive need for a sin bearer. Some Jews still perform an old ritual known as kaporis. The ceremony may seem primitive, but it harks back to the sacrifices which God demanded for forgiveness during the temple era. Consider the colorful description of Chaim Shaus. The second day before Yom Kippur has special significance in that it is the day of Kippurus. The men use roosters for the ceremony and the women use hens. When the family is large, it is rather expensive to supply a fowl for each member of the family, so money is used instead. First, the fowl or the money is held in the hand and everyone reads selections from certain psalms, beginning with the words, sons of Adam. And then the fowl is circled around the head nine times the following being recited at the same time. This is instead of me. This is an offering on my account. This is an expiation for me. This rooster or hen shall go to his or her death, or this money shall go to charity. And may I enter a long and healthy life. The 10 days of penitence are not sufficient to list all of my sins. I'm certain that neither fasting nor reciting wrote prayers from a book, nor even waving a chicken over my head will atone for my sins. Admittedly, I need a more perfect expiation or atonement for sin. And certainly this is a personal matter and people hearing my words or reading my words may see things differently. I believe that we would still have our sacrifices if we still had our temple. Neither the ACLU nor the ASPCA would hinder our priestly practice because the Hebrew Bible details the demands for a sacrifice to obtain forgiveness.
Allow me for a moment to talk about Yom Kippur. Is it our day of atonement or is it a holiday in flux? I'll begin with a question. When did the observance of Yom Kippur get promoted to the most important event of the Jewish year? And the answer is nobody really knows, but it certainly wasn't the preeminent festival of the year until it was reinvented by later rabbis. Within later Judaism, Yom Kippur has been exalted to a place of extreme significance. Sadly, little is known with any certainty of the specific circumstances surrounding the transformation. One scholar wrote that we cannot be certain when all these changes and reforms in the Jewish calendar took place. For all this happened in a period of Jewish history regarding which there's little documentation. The 400 years between the first destruction of Jerusalem and the rise of the Hasmoneans. In these 400 years, there evolved a practically new Jewish spiritual life with new forms and institutions. It is therefore not surprising that we know so little of the greatest holiday that arose in that period, Yom Kippur. According to one of the leading rabbis of world Judaism, Aidan Steinsaltz declared, Yom Kippur, though classified among the usual run of festivals, differs from them in that, like the Sabbath, it is a day of rest on which work is forbidden, and it is clear from the Torah, and even from tradition, that the Sabbath interdicts are even more stringent than those pertaining to Yom Kippur. There are no great practical implications. Beyond fasting, which is the most noteworthy distinction of the festival, Yom Kippur is treated as a Sabbath with comparable work prohibitions. It is called a Shabbat Shabbaton, a Sabbath of complete rest. Moses described the day as follows. It is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any manner of work in that same day, that soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It is a statute forever. Throughout your generations, in all your dwellings, it shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest, and ye shall afflict your souls." One primary difference that can be readily identified between the Sabbath and the Day of Atonement relates to the punishment for disobeying the biblical injunctions. The violation of the Sabbath laws is punishable by execution by an earthly court, while the violation of the Yom Kippur laws is punishable by excision. There are five Yom Kippur afflictions. And the rabbis traditionally teach that in addition to the regular Sabbath prohibitions, observant Jews must follow the five basic restrictions to avoid profaning the Day of Atonement. These added regulations are intended to fulfill the biblical injunction, and you shall afflict your souls. The afflictions are as follows. Number one, it is a fast day. Therefore, no eating or drinking is allowed from sundown on the night prior to the festival, it's called Erev Yom Kippur, until sundown the following evening. This is to be adhered to by all healthy folk. Well, various exceptions exist for the sick and small children. Samaritans, who reject the oral law, extend the fasting requirement to babes in arms as well. Number two, there is to be no bathing on Yom Kippur. Number three, no one should anoint their bodies with oil on Yom Kippur. Number four, sexual relations are forbidden on Yom Kippur. And number five, it is forbidden to wear leather shoes. And some suggest observance requires going barefoot on Yom Kippur. One scholar says that all of these activities were considered physically pleasurable. To go barefoot or wear non-leather shoes was believed by the rabbis to be much less comfortable than wearing leather shoes. It's written, God told Moses that he required an atoning sacrifice. 
The rabbis, unable to accommodate the biblical demands, advanced interesting alternatives. A beautiful festival liturgy took root instead of pursuing the actual biblical atonement prescribed in Scripture. So there are five services in the Yom Kippur liturgy. The fast is typically endured while involved in a lengthy time of prayer, worship, and fellowship in the synagogue. One finds himself surrounded by family, friends, and members of the Jewish community. The spirit of repentance often dwells in the sweetness of the synagogue. Repentance is first horizontal, and only then can it be vertical. In essence, we must first attempt to make peace with our fellow man before we can gain peace with God. We must seek forgiveness from those whom we have wronged if we are to find forgiveness from God. Tradition tells us that Yom Kippur represents the time when God is closing the account books for the year. We focus on God during this precious season of prayer. Our first service is Kol Nidre. It's named for the prayer that is chanted on the evening prior, Erev Yom Kippur. The evening preceding that, that day of the festival. And then there is Shacharit, the morning service. This service is similar to the morning service of other festivals. The scriptures are read. There's a Haftorah section from Isaiah chapter 57 and chapter 58. The Torah reading details the, the temple service. Uh, Musaf, the additional service. This holiday has several interesting alterations to a standard Musaf service. It is in this section that the scapegoat, Azazel, and the martyrology are discussed. Both sections convey a notion of atonement for sins via the sacrifice of another. The martyrology describes the various Talmudic sages who were killed. Mincha, the afternoon service, is the shortest of the day. Ni'ilah, this unique concluding service, symbolically closes the gates of heaven. It reminds all hearers that the time is short. There's a clear sense of urgency associated with the Elah, and some people stand throughout the entire service. The ark is often left open. Observant Jews want God to hear their prayers as the service draws to a climactic conclusion and ends with the powerful final blast of the shofar, the ram's horn. It is written, the shofar, which is the central symbol of the high holy days, marks the definitive end to the day and to the whole period. It evokes the feeling of a successful passage from sin to repentance, from death to life. Some commentators say it is blown as a reminder of the great shofar blast of the Jubilee year. I agree with those commentators. It is appropriate to remember that the great Jubilee was foretold in the Hebrew Bible. God's words to Moses for the children of Israel mirrored the words of America's earliest patriots. Nearly 25 years before America's independence was declared, the creation of what became known as our Liberty Bell was commissioned to be cast. Before America's freedom was purchased by the blood of the martyrs during the American Revolution, the holy words, proclaim liberty throughout the land, were already charged to be enshrined on the Liberty Bell. Those words continue to declare our glorious history and our more glorious future hope. Liberty is ours because others sacrificed to convey it to us. Much blood was shed through the centuries to protect our freedom. Those same words continue to bear witness to the special honor God associated with Yom Kippur and the concept of sacrifice that followed every year on that Day of Atonement. Our atonement for sin could not be bought with the lives of imperfect humans. No amount of their blood could secure our atonement, but it was valuable and effective in successfully freeing America 
from the tyranny that bound them to England. That famous verse from the Jewish Bible, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, must always point us back to the truths of a biblical Yom Kippur and the expectation of our own soon coming Jubilee. The words inscribed on the Liberty Bell compelled the founding fathers of America to fight for their freedom and to share their vision of independence with anyone who would join in this great nation's struggle to be free. The Liberty Bell now housed at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, was rung at the first public reading of America's Declaration of Independence. May the bells of freedom continue to ring true and may our freedom be preserved so that we can pursue our beliefs and freely declare our religious convictions to anyone who might be interested. Blood was shed for our freedom sacrifices were made for our freedom. As has been well said by others, freedom is not free. A new jubilee is on the horizon. Be joyful, be loud, ring the bells of freedom as we await the day of our final redemption. A spiritual jubilee is coming. As predicted in the Holy Bible, it begins with atonement. It is with both sincerity and solemnity that I present additional facts of how my people observe the biblical festival of Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement. It begins with the Kol Nidre service. Well, we have to stop right there for this episode. We'll pick back up talking about the Kol Nidre service next time. If you want to get a head start on the rest of the series, though, there's an easy way for you to do that. You can head on over to crosstalk.org and you can get your own copy of the book that this series is based on. We also have a free PDF download that you can have access to, no strings attached. We have to charge for the physical copy since there is of course an expense involved in printing them, but the digital copy is completely free. While you're there, you'll also see some of the other books and some of the other music and things that we've produced uh, here at Crosstalk over the last years. We recently actually celebrated 50 years of ministry. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of stuff to choose from. If you want to keep up with Crosstalk, I also encourage you to follow us on all the major social media platforms with the handle at Crosstalk TV. We often post things that I think you'll appreciate and enjoy. And lastly, I encourage you to pray about supporting Crosstalk financially. We are a viewer supported program. And so every gift certainly does help us to keep ministry going. We don't always bring up the money conversation because frankly, we don't rely on your viewers, on our viewers to fund our productions. We solely rely on God. But that being said, if God asks you to give to our ministry, we, we certainly have a few options for you to help. You can give on our website, crosstalk.org, or you can give by calling 1-800-688-3422. And of course, you can give by mail as well. All donations are tax deductible. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.